Welcome back, everybody, to a, another live stream. And today we are going to talk buckles, bike buckles. Uh, we're gonna. Our guest today is Uriel from Austere Manufacturing. He is the creator, the manufacturer of these kind of artisanally, nicely colored uh, bike buckles that you can use on your bike and other multi-sport things. Um, you guys know I'm super curious in how businesses develop, um, you know, how they came to being, and the, you know, how people move it from just an idea into a product into something that people actually buy. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we jump in, uh, speaking of making stuff, we have some stickers. Whoops, this one's upside down. Uh, as you guys know, I'm just a, a, a fancy sticker salesman with a YouTube channel. And if you like this content, check out the links below, buy a sticker, join us in Patreon and all that good stuff. Uh, but without further ado, let's introduce uh, Uriel to the show. Did I pronounce that right or did I butcher your name? Yeah, that's, that's right, Uriel. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So how how does one get into the buckle business? Like, what was your, your background <laughs> <laughs> leading up to this? <laughs> yeah. Um, so definitely, uh, let's see. I don't know where to start exactly. Um, I guess, so I went to school for industrial design at Carnegie Mellon. Um, in sophomore year, I guess I was trying to find a backpack that I liked. Um, I couldn't find one. Um, and so I decided I'd make my own and got a sewing machine and started sewing. And um, three years later, I guess, had something that resembled a backpack. <laughs> uh, but it was a very process. Uh, soft goods in general, just really, I don't, something about it really, uh, I enjoyed. So, I think partly just the kind of physical manipulation of figuring out how soft goods go together is very challenging and fun and creative. Uh, the fact that it doesn't really have a definite form, like there is some amount of sort of experience and knowledge about how the fabric will end up performing, not just theoretically its shape. Uh, there are a lot of aspects to it that I enjoyed, one of which for sure, which I think a lot of folks enjoy is with a pretty... Um, minimal tool set and a big table you can make basically the same thing that's coming out of any factory right a few exceptions to that for sure but and and i think more and more <laughs> there's some exceptions but um still you can make very good gear and so started making gear uh then got into she bought a uh, surly pugsley and went and did the tnga the trans north georgia trail not as a race just drove down there and biked it me and my partner and uh another friend and we made all the gear and we had never gone bike packing and it was um my, my brother saw us making the gear and he was like i think you're just gonna go down there and fix broken gear the whole time. <laughs> um and we actually did uh the first hill we rolled down we went through a tiny little drainage ditch and one of my buckles broke i oh, know um, <laughs> so uh, I thought he was going to be right, but we actually completed the trip. It was a lot of fun. Uh, that buckle broke across all the bags we made and we kind of just made do. But uh, I also did a lot of work in the Robotics Institute there um, and ran uh, the Robotics Club machine shop. Um, and so kind of was introduced to machining and really fell in love with that. In high school, I grew up uh, as a whole garage full of tools. Uh, so I was always playing in there, built like a boat and a car and suits of armor and trebuchets and, uh, you know, potato cannons and ski bikes <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. Um, and in, in that shop, well, if, if you've built stuff, you know, locational accuracy is a, is a challenge. Like you try to match a whole pattern for, to mount something like even as simple as hanging a power strip on your wall. And then you don't get it lined up properly and it's annoying and it's difficult to get right. Um, so the first time I saw a milling machine where you can just turn a knob and read out thousands of an inch, I was like, wow, this is <laughs> amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, I did a lot of um, built all sorts of things uh, through their lunar landers and uh, ground effect vehicles um, simultaneously working in the costume shop uh, of the theater department. Very, very skilled uh, um, pattern maker and draper there who kind of took me under his wing and uh, taught me a thing or two. Um, ended up getting some internships and ended up 
actually like so soft goods design is just not very common especially people who can actually make prototypes um and have a very good sense of how parts are going to come how the sewing machine operator is going to actually put together something you design and so i ended up getting a good amount of work doing exactly that where oftentimes a company had started off with a designer that was kind of like aesthetically here's something nice and they'd work together and but then when it came time to actually make something um the design needed adjustment to make all the panels go together and so on so that was kind of it um through that whole time i was kind of always looking for buckles uh, and couldn't really find what i wanted so i mentioned like breaking a buckle on our first bike packing trip subsequent bikepacking trips but also just as for uh everyday carry you know just walking around town um you can buy these crazy fancy fabrics nowadays right like dyneema and x-pack and all this crazy stuff mm -hmm. that's super cool and then you have a team of uh designers spend weeks uh refining these designs and then they're literally held together with like 15 to 30 cent pieces of plastic um, <laughs> it's not so like so, so yeah. i guess for for those that don't know like um there there's pretty, there's like kind of a limited ish catalog of of hardware that people that you know create soft goods have access to right it's not like they can just come up with the, their own hardware if, even if they wanted to. There's 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 like some limitations. Yeah, there's a number of companies. I mean, there's a ton of companies out there. I would say uh, high end products. If you're if you look at the buckles, uh, there's like you know a handful of companies that are making hardware, and they're very good. Um, they're high value um, injection molded plastic. Um, is very inexpensive is quite uh it, it delivers for for 90 percent of folks i think it's a good choice um given the given the price um and, and yeah so you, as a designer you would sort of go through these catalogs go through your samples and go like okay we really want something that looks like this or functions like this or feels this way and then in the end you kind of settle for what's available <laughs> i would say one advantage of working at some bigger companies um some of them do kind of have the volumes to start doing custom stuff and you do see that from time to time uh that said like designing a good buckle as i've learned <laughs> is a lot more challenging than it seems and there's a lot of sort of funny failure modes or like does it jam when you press it together does it pack with snow how does it deal with sand you you know all these things so i think gen um if you're a company that specializes in soft goods design um you're not necessarily going to then try to bite off a big uh <clears throat> technical challenge sorry uh challenge of designing your own buckles so you tend to pick from catalogs that exist and if you talk to soft goods designers that's often a, a kind of a frustration because the perceive the, the quality say you want to make something that feels really quality and looks great and, um, you know, feels good in your hand. Um, and this is just an opinion, but my feeling is that, uh, the plastic kind of falls short. Um, mm -hmm. for me it did. And then also from a functional perspective, especially for bike packing, uh, or other, other sports where you have a lot of jostling over hours and, um, you you tend to have to keep tightening things so those are the two frustrations for me um for like sort of stuff it's kind of like i actually just want to be able to send the money and get a really nice buckle that feels nice and looks great i'm using this thing every day um so that's what i was after i don't know if you're familiar with uh austria alpine the cobra buckle um mm, anyway so. it, it's it's like if you look at companies that have similar frustrations every now and then you'll find a company that puts uh uses the cobra buckle on their bags it's mostly everyday carry kind of stuff like high-end um you know messenger bags that's more of a fashion thing uh they're super nice they look really cool and they feel cool um it's this big cnc machine buckle the issue mm -hmm. is they're literally designed for skydiving and other <laughs> you know, kind of safety critical stuff. So they're like 45 to 85 grams a piece. Okay. Uh, so if you put like five of those on a bag. <laughs> it's a pound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
So I actually bought a bunch of them and put them on some bags. And I was like, this is cool, but I wish there was something that was actually optimized for this use case where I don't need it to take thousands of pounds. I need it to take maybe a few hundred pounds. So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm sorry, but I'm holding up uh, one of the buckles uh, that Austria makes on, on the channel right now. It's like, what's, I mean, it looks like a fairly simple thing. What What's something that, I know that the average, like, I guess, person wouldn't pick up on that. That was a point of, um, I know, difficulty. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's been a lot. Uh, so I think starting out, I figured sort of like what you said, you know, it's uh, this isn't a new type of buckle, right? If you've tied a kayak to the roof of a car, you've used a very similar buckle. Um, those are die cast. So if you want to get you typically end up in a die cast buckle or a stamped buckle. Uh, die cast buckles tend to be very heavy as the metal cools in the metal die. You're pouring in molten metal. And as it cools, the crystalline structure that forms tends to be quite large. And that makes it brittle. And so to account for that, they tend to have larger cross sections. You also need the metal to be able to flow through the mold before it cools. And uh, so they tend to be too heavy. But anyway, it's not a new type of buckle, as you mentioned. Um, so I kind of figured like, oh, I'll see and see it. I'll be able to make it lighter um, and still really strong. Um, so the first one I made that resembled a buckle uh, <laughs> enough to assemble it. Um, when I load tested it, you know, even just by hand, you could actually make the webbing slip through. Hmm. And so which I was not expecting at all. Um, so it turns out that like how the teeth uh, in those in the buckle kind of interact with the webbing is and getting a good balance where it really locks onto the webbing when you pull it but then if you pull these to failure uh the webbing tends to break first sometimes the uh buckle breaks but it tends to be the webbing and then you want to actually even if you don't load it to failure you want to then be able to release it fairly easily right so mm -hmm. If you make it grab too well when you load it it's just going to jam and you're not going to be able to open it um so make, getting that balance right uh took a lot of trial and error um, so are are the teeth on the buckle is it optimized to the webbing that you use i'm assuming it sort of is uh we've tested with a lot of webbings at this stage we've gotten it to a point where it really tends to just hold um pretty much anything um Yes, uh, but we did kind of start with this, but then we once we, it worked with this webbing, we kind of tried others. Um, and yeah, yes, so the teeth, uh, teeth were a big one. Um, also kind of balancing weight and getting the weight right. Um, so we actually used to have a stainless steel pin before we launched. Um, and it just didn't quite pass the sniff test. Like you'd hold it in your palm and these are like a lot of people kind of comment like when they get their hands on them, they're like, wow, this is actually lighter than I quite a bit lighter than I expected. So um, but those ones, when you held them in your palm, you're it, it, you felt it. It was kind of heavy. So we switched to titanium. Um, and. Yeah, so so that was that was um, I, I think just balancing the weight and function and getting that really dialed into a point where and, and always my guiding um kind of north star is what do i want mm -hmm. and you know obviously that's an issue if you're trying to design for someone who you're not uh <laughs> that's that's not you <laughs> right. um, but I, I think typically people do a pretty bad job of designing they don't really have an empathy for i mean like some of these auto makers um made old suits so you'd strap this suit on. You might have seen photos of it. I feel like it's been published, uh, written about, but uh, with kind of rubber bands attaching different points on your body to make it like quite difficult <laughs> to bend over and quite difficult to like do all these right. things, limit your range of motion. And then a designer can actually experience their design. Right. And go like, wow, this is not great. It would be <laughs> so much easier if we made this simple change. Um, so I don't think that's unusual, but that's kind of how I look at it. It's like, you know, is this and that's kind of why we started with this buckle uh, was my major frustration with bikepacking gear. Most of the failures I've seen and most of the failures I've experienced with bikepacking gear comes down to the buckles. Um, they sure. just loosen over time. And then especially. So let's see if you take a buckle um, like. A, 
last debacle. They are Wait, you, you broke up. Uh, you broke up a little bit. Can oh, you yeah. Sorry. back up? Um, so the plastic plastic buckles are typically designed to be loaded in a straight line. So I don't know if you've mm -hmm. experienced this where you like tuck a water bottle under a buckle and then you try to cinch it down and it doesn't really hold. Um, they just develop a lot less friction. So that was one issue. The other was um, kind of on like long single track descents. My bags would be bouncing around and then I'd cinch them down. And I'm like, okay, I want it tighter, but I also don't want to break. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of tired of that. So in Oregon, actually, I did the, a section of the Oregon Timber Trail and had that experience where I was going down a big descent. They're bouncing around. And then I overdid it and I snapped a buckle. <laughs> and that was kind of uh, actually right before I bought this machine. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Buckles and zippers. Those are the, you know, yeah. the, the, the points of, uh, of frustration with a lot of the of bike bags in my experience. For sure. Um, let's see. So uh, how about this? Sp one thing I like about it, uh, the buckle also is like the spring tension. It just feels like really nice and positive but not so strong that you know you need like muscular fingers to, to operate them <laughs> uh, well i'm glad i'm glad to hear that uh i did spend weeks on that um <laughs> and testing with a lot of different folks we actually made we started by winding our own springs and that was partly to be able to get that kind of dialed in and then um yeah we obviously outsourced it at this point because yeah, we were doing it by hand. <laughs> <There are people>. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't practical. But uh, it's sort of balancing the uh, spring tension with also, you know, things I didn't know going in. Um, torsion springs, they have a life expectancy, uh, how many cycles before they kind of get brittle. Um, and so getting that to a point, you know, we're around... 10,000 reps or more, which I figure is about 40 years of like very hard use, like very hard use. So, yeah. <laughs> and then if you try to get it higher than that, um, this would thing would need many, many springs mm -hmm. uh, because you basically have the amount of force it will, the spring will output has to do with the wire diameter, the number of coils and the coil diameter. And as you thicken the wire, you decrease the lifespan. Um, as you increase the coil diameter, you increase the lifespan. And as you increase the number of coils, your total deflection of each segment of wire, if you can picture that, mm -hmm. is less for the same deflection of the end of the legs of the sp torsion spring. And so you increase the life there. So kind of playing with those uh, to get a good feel uh, to have it like really feel positive and then to get a really high life expectancy out of the spring. Um, yeah, it was, was a, a fun challenge. And actually, we, we were about to launch. Um, <laughs> and I was just like, let's see. So we were about to launch with a much stiffer spring. And someone was like, this is maybe too hard. So <laughs> we a softer spring. And um, yeah, people, people were kind of happy with it. To me, like after playing with it with a much stiffer spring, it felt a little bit soft almost, but I feel like mm -hmm. it is, it, yeah, I, I like so, it. Are, so are you having the springs custom made for you or did you end up buying a, a stock stock spring? Uh, yeah, more learning. Um, <laughs> it is a custom spring. If there is a video on our Instagram way back, just a photo of the front of spring making in. Um, so it's underscore manufacturing and they're quite complicated and there's a lot of tools that get set. And so it's a bit of a guess and check process to get a spring that's coming off within spec. And so it's basically like when you're paying for, for springs, <laughs> you're basically paying for, you know, five hours of someone's time of a specialized person to set up <laughs> one of these machines. And then you just and then there's like marginal cost with you know you can see the size of these springs like it's not much to run and not, you know you're paying for wire plus setup time essentially right. and so custom springs um are just much quite a bit more expensive uh unfortunately because it's not you know some some of these standard spring sizes people have machines that are running those for you know essentially years <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so yeah you're you're almost just paying for material at that stage 
And so, yeah, we, we had to go custom. Again, we couldn't find a, a spring that um, was kind of stiff enough um, for the deflection angles we were looking for in the size we were looking for. So we would have had to go to a, a thicker buckle, and we didn't really want to do that. So, Are you guys using a, a common, uh, commonly manufactured um, size spring in terms of in terms of the the pin or is that custom? Um, the pin is uh, eighth of an inch, so pretty standard. Um, the spring, like once you're custom winding, it doesn't really matter. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't know if it's standard. <laughs> <laughs> we just told them exactly what we wanted. Right. So aside from titanium pins and custom springs, another, I think, unique thing about uh, the buckles is the color. Um, was that a decision that, you know, you wanted to do early on or was it like a, a sales move? Like where, where did the inspiration for, for having, you know, nicely uh, painted buckles come from? Yeah. Um, so it was not a part of what I kind of set out to do. Um, we some of the early prototypes we finally got them on a bag and went for a ride and i took some shots trying to kind of you know something i was going to show and they're black buckles on a black bag <laughs> over black bar tape and i was like okay a this is a really small product so it's already kind of hard to take like kind of lifestyle photos of right where you right. Don't buckle and so at that point, I was like, OK, we need some bright colors so you can actually see what we're making. <laughs> the other thing is, and, and actually, um, some of the friends I went to uh, design school with, um, they were quite surprised uh, to see me do colors because I was kind of the guy <laughs> that was like function first. You know, if it works, it's fine. I don't really care how it looks. Um, but, uh, we, you know, I, I think the color interesting and i have like if you're getting away from plastic for aesthetic reasons you may as well take it all the way and see like <laughs> what you can do with that so um at this stage i don't see yeah like some of the black buckles when people order black buckles it's like oh. <laughs> <laughs> why <laughs> yeah cool um let's see uh, yeah, so actually, I, I'd be curious to hear your feedback on this. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of requests for uh, anodize, so we're trying to sort of figure out what what colors to do. I don't know if you have any. You have to do purple. That's that's like the on trend color, purple or pink, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like uh, if I were the, I'd want uh, something kind of like a bronze finish like a like a distressed metal that 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 would go well with anything has like a steampunky look um or like a oil slick again these are okay. like <laughs> awesome. yeah i think we're gonna put together a batch so we'll, we'll see what they offer yeah um so how like how have the buckles been received were you uh, surprised or is it you, you wish you wish it could go a little quicker very surprised, I would say. Um, I made it really to fit a very specific need, um, mostly a seat post bag and like attaching things to the fork, you know, to bottle cages or something or like the everything cages. Um, the reason I started with this was, yeah, again, just something I wanted to exist. I figured it would be a good thing to start with because it's a multi-piece assembly. So you actually have like tolerancing you have to hit so that the assembly goes together. Oh. And so I sort of figured we'd launch this one. People would be like, that is cool. It would be pretty niche. Um, and that we wouldn't really sell very many. And so I have a lot of other <laughs> buckle designs that I've worked on over the years uh, that I'd love to get out. But it's just been uh kind of crazy every time we increase our capacity thinking like okay we're just gonna get ahead of it we're gonna be able to make them much faster and uh have time to do other things and then uh demand has kind of just kept um increasing which great problem to have um we are tucked into a very small shop and uh yeah looking to grow probably get another machine um just kind of like this one's kind of running um 
not quite all the time, but you know, we're currently trying to get it to run overnight so that it frees up some daytime for R and D, uh, so we can kind of some new products. Uh, but then it's still like we're we're probably gonna need a second one to run these. So yeah, so very surprised um, with the reception. People really like them. Um, I think you know this wasn't really a category at all uh I, maybe that's wrong <laughs> you know i guess like <laughs> ski strap i mean but... i feel i feel like there was like a little president there was you know the john's irish straps that rivenel sold and yeah. you know the yeah. belay straps were a thing for a while uh but this really like kicked it up a notch to you know it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so um yeah definitely definitely surprised by how many people want these um you know, you have some over there, so I'm excited to see uh, how you like them. Um, but most folks, I guess, we, we see a lot of people who come buy like one or two and then come back and buy like four to eight. Because uh, I think once you try them, they really just are very secure. So you cinch it down, um, which is pretty nice, I guess. I say weirdly because I think you don't realize how much uh, some other options are not doing that until you try something that is. I think that's like when people do the ski straps over the uh, like just a plastic buckle, I think people are like, wow, this is great. Like you just kind of click it in. Right. It's right there. <laughs> you know, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, the issue is like on a bike trip, I think having one or two in your frame bag, they kind of take up a lot of space. So with these, they're very light. Uh, just to give you a sense, um, like the jumbo ski straps um, that are like, I think they're 32 inches long. Um, those are around 64 grams and then our three quarter inch, uh, strap 36 inches long is 22 grams. So almost oh. third, you know, 30, like a third of the weight, um, a little over, I guess. Um, and then they also just stow very small. Yeah. They, yeah. And yeah the ski straps are pretty chunky. So like they have a couple <laughs> backup straps or just. Um, and especially for me with cargo bikes, so I'm a big fan of, uh, biking, not just for fun, but also like to get groceries and like straps kind of add a lot of weight. So I was carrying the cast, um, cam straps before this, but each one is just the buckles, like 65 grams. And so you're always like, well, I don't want to throw too many <laughs> adds up and then mostly not using them. So it's been nice to, you know, just keep a, a bunch on the cargo bike and then really anything I uh, have to pick up. I'm not short on straps. Um, so, yeah, they, they've really uh, picked up. And then we launched into the bike industry because it was just a thing I was passionate about and kind of knew the space, I guess. Um, and but it turns out a lot of other folks have had very similar issues. So like um, all, all sorts of pursuits, I think. Yeah. So is the goal to uh, be like an OEM supplier for the buckles for, for other makers or? Um, yeah, we're kind of exploring where we fit in. Uh, I think that that was definitely originally the goal. Um, I think just in terms of unit economics of all that, I suspect like we have a couple manufacturers who are using them. And I think more and more people will start picking up uh, nicer hardware. I mean, you saw the adoption of like Fidlock mm -hmm. uh, magnetic hardware, definitely more expensive than just a typical buckle. But I think that's sort of being picked up more and more. And over the last, I feel like three, four years, it's become quite common instead of like very rare. Um, I suspect we'll see a similar thing just in general. Because uh, I think I think like in general, people are a little bit tired maybe of buying something over and over that doesn't quite scratch the itch. And sometimes you're just like, you know, mm -hmm. I just want to like spend the money, get the thing I need. Um, so that is the goal uh, to be an OEM. But, you know, we launched the straps partly to show OEMs that this is something that people, you know, we, we definitely got laughed at uh, a few times when we mentioned, I, I talked to like, I have some designer friends at like the North Face. And so I just got on a call with them and I was like, hey, like, this is probably not something the North Face is interested in. But like, what do you think about this? And they're like, wow, that sounds really cool. 
until I mentioned the price, you're kind of like, I think you're kind of out of your mind. Um, and so. So is this kind of like, a, I guess, like a proof of concept that there's market demand for for yeah. a really nice buckle? And um, it, that's good. And then I think also from what we've learned with this buckle, again, this has, you know, three machined components on a spring. Um, I think there's going to be other buckles that we have planned that are going to be at a price point that um, might be easier for folks to integrate into their products and still be able to kind of sell it to a store that then sells it to a, um, to an end user. Right. I mean, at this point, like what, what could you do to get the unit price down just other than just making a crap ton more? Um. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, there's yeah there's there's just like there's a floor on what you can do i mean we could go we could injection mold it. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's what we could do um or you can stamp it or you can die cast it um if you're seeing seeing them uh you basically work like uh, we're running one of the fastest cncs you can get and so there's not much more we can do in terms of equipment necessarily um we are working on automation so that we can run the, the machine overnight. And that sort of, you're basically amortizing the cost of the machine over its useful life and how many hours it's producing. Um, and so the more hours it produces, the lower that kind of minute cost is. Um, and so actually I have some, some bits, some future projects we're working on now is uh, this is a flip station. Oh, let's see, get it in a frame here. So the part gets machined. So you start with a block of aluminum um let's grab a tool here basically bring a cutter in and cut away parts of the aluminum and then half of the body is machined and then we right now we manually flip that in a big tray of parts and then the machine comes in and machines off the back if that makes any sense i don't mm -hmm. know what it was actually <laughs> but um that's so that's a manual problem it's how much uh, how much runtime we can get be between uh, human kind of intervention. And so the idea with this is the machine, you know, runs op one and then it goes into, let's see here. Uh, these are grippers, so they move in and out. And so then it comes in here and then this whole unit swivels 180 and then it goes right back into the machine and finishes, you know, a, a complete part comes off. And so... So is that taking the place of um, a tool that plugs into where a tool would be? The um, so that that is mounted on the table. What is okay. up in the yeah? So in the tool changer, which you can kind of see behind me there, um, this whole ring here is filled with uh, holds twenty one tools. Um, there's actually a gripper that's sort of like this um, that mounts to a tool holder. And then spindle air, so there's air that comes through the spindle machine and actuates, and that's what's moving the parts around. So, yeah, we have trays of aluminum blocks that are picked up by that gripper, and then they go over to a pneumatic vise, squeezes it, machines the thing, and then the gripper right now puts it back in the tray, and then we manually flip that op one part into an op two position on the tray. Um, and so our trays hold anywhere from like 20 parts, 20 blocks of op one, and 20 blocks of op two um, up to like 40 parts. Um, but with this flip station, we'll be able to put 40 parts on the machine or more. We're probably gonna get up to 80 and then we're thinking of double stacking them on the trays. Um, and so that starts to get us into like a eight hour runtime. Um, then the challenge becomes, you know, yes, you made a lot of parts overnight, but are they good parts? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so you don't wanna, as you just made eight hour garbage um and, and so things we're doing to mitigate that um you can do in process probing so another t cool tool you can stick in these machines is a little um sphere it's uh has a jewel on the end it's a sapphire sphere or ruby i guess they're ruby uh spheres and then it can come and touch the part and record the positions and so mm -hmm. you can sort of tell it like what is in spec and what is out of spec and so we might do like an inspection on every 10th part and then if it's out of spec it stops machining now 
that's like a geometric test, right? It's not necessarily going to pick up like surface finish. So then you want to do like tool life management, like how many hours of or minutes do you have of a particular cutter in in like actually cutting aluminum and then just with kind of historical data you start to know how and maybe we swap the tool 10 10 before that we really start to see deterioration in surface finish um so those are some yeah, of those to, things. have you had have you had to swap tools already oh yeah 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 uh <laughs> So we do a tool break detect right now where after cutting with some of the smaller cutters, it goes and makes sure we didn't snap off the tool because sometimes when they get dull, they just snap. Um, but other things, yeah, start to see much bigger burrs on some parts. And so then they go through tumbling and then we get them out and it's like, we can't, you know, this is not usable. And so we've definitely uh, kind of learned um, it's normally after doing like two to three thousand buckles you have to change the tools um when cutting aluminum these tools are made out of carbide which is a super hard material um tool life in aluminum um some yeah it's not yeah it's basically infinite um but i think when you're run that sort of job shop mentality where you're running like 10 100 of something you don't really count the tool life into your costs but when you're doing a mm -hmm. thousand or you know ten thousand it starts to become yeah something we need to monitor yeah so we actually really have cool i mean it, oh sorry oh as it's a uh, it's so fascinating to hear this i mean um like ian had kind of touched on it uh, when i when we interviewed him yeah uh, he said that you were good at making your machine act like a machine inside the machine like uh you know some levels of automate automation within just the the cnc machine <laughs> yeah so i mean when so you're sort of asked about like starting a business i think in general like manufacturing in the u.s is challenging uh primarily because of labor costs um and then some of the support infrastructure around that but, but uh, it's all challenging to get into any soon because like a robotic arm, which is often how people feed these machines, a robotic arm is like, you know, $50,000, right? And it's like, okay, I understand the economics of that making sense, but it's still $50,000. <laughs> right. It's a lot of buckles you got to sell first. <laughs> <laughs> right. And especially making a buckle that I, you know, that's very niche and is this going to sell? Um and so uh, as a nice stepping stone for automation, like this is really convenient because um, way less expensive. And if you think about it, I already, you know, we, we invested in a, in a pretty serious robot, right? It is right. the same <laughs> thing. Um, it's just optimized for a different action. And so, uh, yeah, just loading in these uh, grippers has been really, really nice. And then the other piece is, if a robot makes sense down the road, because there's arrangements where like you can put these back to back and then one of the machines. Um, and anyway, so so those robots have these grippers on the ends anyway, and you need a mm -hmm. pneumatic device. So this is all money you'd have to spend anyway toward automation. The other thing about a robotic arm is I've never programmed one. So on top of $50,000, you're then like, okay, now I need to learn how to program this totally new thing. I need to make sure it's talking to the machine. I understand that that's probably not too difficult, but it's still going to be a few days of figuring out like, what is the communication? I mean, anyone who's right. tried to connect their home printer knows <laughs> it's going to take longer than you hope. Um, yeah, so... So I, I think like automation is really important um, to stay competitive just globally. Um, and, and the other piece is, so uh, if you read about like Toyota is a very successful um, manufacturer, obviously, uh, more than a lot of people realize, like they're, they don't sell as many cars, but their profits are much higher than, than any other car maker. Um, and they use a lot of, not strictly automation um i mean they use a lot of automation <laughs> of course but but they're not just like automated you know anything but um basically freeing people up to do what people are good at uniquely good at over a machine you know a machine is actually quite good at tending the machine and making sure it doesn't stop 
um, but it is not that creative. So um, just around the shop, like we definitely tried to make things more ergonomic and just easier for people to do. And um, uh, automation is a big piece of that. And then we can kind of focus on uh, more interesting pursuits. Yeah. So, yeah. So when someone, I guess, like box at the the price of the buckle, like what's how do you how do you justify the price to to that person? Uh, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I, if you don't, if you feel it's expensive, you're not wrong. It is expensive <laughs> compared to you know a plastic buckle. Um, I guess if you look at other CNC'd uh, objects. Um, these are actually quite inexpensive. So like other people who run CNC machines, um, you know, they'll comment like, how are you doing it so cheap? Um, <laughs> so it's just like, I would say you get what you pay for. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, it's just a, it's just a expensive way of doing things. Um, and it has some benefits and the big downside I would say is cost. Um, so, you know, the triangle of like in, in product development, it's like speed or anything creative. It's like speed, quality, cost. Pick right. two. <laughs> yeah. really, uh, speed is probably just like, yeah, I don't know. Um, weight, performance and cost, maybe those would be. the Yeah. Three. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's kind of no getting around that. You know, if you look at. You guys were, I don't know if you still have them on the site, but like the head, head, you know, the head caps. Uh, yeah. The stem cap, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, those, those are CNC'd and they're expensive. Yeah. <laughs> That's just what it is. So, yeah. Um, so what are, what future products that you can talk about? Do you have down the line? Is it more, more buckles or are you hoping, hoping to do other different types of bike components? Um, probably more buckles at this stage. Um, yeah. So like one is some form of quickly disconnecting, uh, and reconnecting, you know, like, a, <laughs> a buckle kind of filled. Uh, these aren't great for an application where you're kind of, where you want really quick access to be able to uh, like we use them a lot to attach uh, a dry bag to our handlebars or something like that. Right. Um, and the big downside there is it's sort of annoying. Like it's not quick to get it hooked up um, or it's, it's, you know, it's like 10 seconds instead of three seconds, but uh, <laughs> <still> marginal gains, <laughs> <laughs> but something for that kind of application where it's like a quick connect. Uh, I'd love to launch something like that. And then also um, some more like one piece, parts of uh soft goods so like uh what's called a tri-glide uh which is i'm sure you've seen them it's it looks like three bars of plastic with a frame um mm -hmm. and so like we'd love to do like a set of d-rings tri-glides uh ladder locks uh the lock like at the bottom of your backpack strap and tighten your strap with um so some some cnc equivalent and there uh, you know, there's obviously going to be kind of strength benefits uh, to a CNC buckle, but I think like strength um, is going to be a factor. But primarily at that stage, it would be just kind of like having a really quality, um, full product offering for soft goods designers. So, like, if you want to make a really nice bag where you're really not cutting corners on anything, uh, so we've just had some requests for that where it's like if you imagine integrating this buckle into a bag that then has a bunch of plastic components next to it like sometimes that's fine but other times that starts to look a little weird maybe so yeah yeah incongruous <laughs> <laughs> cool so we've got about 60 people in the live stream if you have questions about uh austere manufacturing buckles the process the business uh, leave those in the comments and I'll be sure to, to pass them on. Um, so for me, like one thing that's pretty interesting is, you know, it's not, it, it sounds like what you're doing is beyond just, you know, conceiving of the design and, and manufacturing, but you play a really heavy hand in like optimizing the business and, um, and all those things. And so you, you had experience in that in, in prior jobs. 
Um, yeah, so actually, uh, right out of school, um, got involved in uh, the, the world of startups. Um, so <laughs> I did a startup um, with uh, a team of folks in water filtration for disaster relief. Um, very interesting. Uh, we did the whole, you know, go raise money um, and then launch a, launch a business. And then from there, I kind of found the niche of helping people um, develop prototypes with an eye toward manufacturability. Uh, so like if you have a product, you're, um, it can be quite difficult to kind of get it to the stage of, of uh, pro proving product market fit is the big thing, right? And like how fast and cheap can you do that? And uh, when, once you... Once you outsource a lot of stuff, I, I see two big two big issues. One is folks who are developing a product in house um, on a three D printer or on something that isn't the method they're going to use for manufacturing, who don't have an awareness of what the eventual target process is going to be, um, end up needing a very complete redesign, and that. Uh, that is is quite a stumbling block for a lot of folks. So kind of helping people with that process where it's like, okay, yes, we're 3D printing this thing, but it will be injection molded. So let's just understand like draft angles and uh, how many actions an injection mold has and how that affects cost. So now we're that's going to cut assembly, but our first mold is going to be $150,000. Like, okay, maybe <laughs> let's trade that. Um, and so just understanding that. So I've done a lot of different materials from soft goods to like injection molded stuff, uh, machined components, um, composites, like just it's something I've always been super interested in. And I think even though I'm not necessarily an expert in, in them, just understanding like, OK, yeah, you should be looking at like stamped components. Um, and here's how we're going to design for that. And we're going to prototype by welding things together, but let's just understand like this, this is where we're headed. So helping people with that. Um, and then also just working at a couple companies, developing products uh, that then went to mass manufacturing and getting to be a part of that process. Um, so I, I, I kind of saw a lot of different aspects of that. And one thing that I, I sort of was a little bit, um, you know, left me wanting more is working on those projects that did go to production. It, it's almost like a handoff where the folks who know a lot about like the customer and the all the thoughts behind the feature set and the design um, kind of like codify exactly what that is and then hand it to a manufacturer. And obviously, like finding a good manufacturing partnership is a whole thing. And Ideally, you find someone who is working with you a bit where they're saying like, oh, hey, could we change this a little bit or could we make this slight change? Um, but I think at that point, you're sort of like peak seeking where it's like, uh, you know, like an algorithm that's like climbs a slope. You're going to find an, an optimum, but it might be a local optimum, right? Like there might be a much better solution, but you don't have all the expertise in one room often to kind of find those big breakthroughs. And so like solutions to problems um, in, in manufacturing, uh, like a product I'd seen designed goes to manufacturing and then they solve these problems that come up without having the perspective of understanding how, how that works with uh, the customer. And like, oh, actually we could redesign this whole thing. So I, I was really, um, I really wanted to, to do something where we had production in-house so that we can do all that. So for example, um, you know, we 3D print and I mean, we're working on some other designs now, but like all of our assembly fixtures, right? And so at this stage, like I've assembled thousands of buckles. I have a very good understanding of what the annoying parts of assembling this buckle are. And so now when we design another buckle or even in uh, redesigning some of that tooling, a, we have the knowledge to know like uh, of what is critical to the product and like what are you compromise on. Um, and then, but, but si simultaneously, like how can we reimagine our manufacturing process to deliver that faster and cheaper? Um, so th that's really fun. And, uh, and, and it's, I, I think that's what keeps me interested in it. You know, 
making thousands of buckles can get kind of boring. But every <laughs> I'm like, okay, it's actually like the customer doesn't actually want to pay for us to rack these parts for paint, right? You don't care if they were racked. You just want the paint on there. Right. So like, could we design a rack that's really fast to put the parts on? And what would that look like? And um, I think often in, in a manufacturing partnership, especially if you're a very small manufacturer, as we are, you know, sort of like a cottage industry um, thing, your, your manufacturing partner isn't necessarily going to want to invest so much time thought into like, hey, if we spent 100 hours, we could probably make this assembly process way, way faster, right? Um, right. Anyway, so that, that's really interesting to me. So. So I'm curious about that that step between you know trying to make something um, manufacturable. What's what are usually things that they get changed from initial design? Is it just like a, a matter of simplification? Um. So on a mechanical front, so my my expertise is definitely like the mechanical side of things. I tell people I know how to solder. I don't know what I'm soldering. Um. So on a mechanical front. I would say the biggest thing I see is like over constraint. And so designing assemblies that are over constrained drives up the need for precision and precision costs money. Um, as your tooling wears, like if you're doing punched parts, as your tooling wears, as your operator gets like a higher tolerance, you're going to get higher reject rates probably unless you're well within the tolerances of that process. Um, and so just, I think a lot of people when they're designing are not thinking about over constraint. So there's this idea of like, well, I don't, this might be too in the weeds, but like <laughs> kinematic constraint, um, a physical body has six degrees of freedom. So you have three translational, so X, Y, Z translational, and then three rotational, right? Um, and so that's six degrees of freedom. You actually like, theoretically, one point of contact, if they're properly arranged, reduces uh, the, the degrees of freedom by one. Um, and so you want to be very aware, like if you're doing a sheet metal assembly. So for example, if you're doing a sheet metal assembly and you have a bracket that runs up between two walls and needs to sort of like slip in there. And if the bracket's too short, it starts like deforming the, the chassis long, you can't jam it in. Like that's a bad design, right? It should on one end and then run over a flange on the other. And even better would be if this side is bolted in, this side has a slot in it. So it's actually like you're designing around having slot. I would say that's a big mm -hmm. one over constraint. I think the other thing is um, ease of assembly often is like pretty bad on rev one of a lot of products. And then they'll do like a redesign. And part of that is inherent because like, you don't know the size of the market. And so often those redesigns are integrating a lot of features into like one casting or a lot of features into one injection mold. And that injection mold is like $50,000. Like you might, the first one, you might be just trying to keep your tooling costs lower and so, and your engineering time lower. And so a lot of those things, um, yeah, so those are big ones. Uh, but I think the important thing, if you are doing it, is understanding where you are on kind of that roadmap of refinement mm -hmm. and matching it to the what you're trying to de-risk about your business. So, like in general, with product development, you sort of have three big risks: you have technical risk, you have team risk, and you have market risk. Right. Do people want to buy it would be market risk. Technical risk would be, can we make it? Like, is it technically feasible? And then team risk is like, do we have the team to do it? Um, and, and kind of identifying like what you're trying to de-risk um, and, and then just being really laser focused on that one thing. So like, if you're trying to demonstrate product market fit, it is really silly to spend a lot of time designing uh, some plastic components so it can be easily injection molded. Like, it might be that no one wants to buy this thing or <laughs> would want to buy it if it had that necessitates a total redesign. Right. And mm -hmm. so like, and then just being like, okay, how can we do this? Like the fastest, cheapest 
like get get these answers as fast and as cheap as possible. I think like that is the biggest stumbling block in general that I see. Um, one example is um, I used to hold office hours uh, for like when I was in Pittsburgh um, for the Carnegie Mellon um, like startup incubator. And there was a team of engineers, of grad students working on uh, motorized shoes, essentially. Mm. And they're like, OK, like, you know, you know a lot about manufacturing. How can we manufacture these shoes to be less than two kilos? And I was like, OK, well, it certainly can be done, right? <laughs> we can make this less than two, two kilos. But like, how did you pick the number two kilos? And they're like, well, it just seems light. Like, well, maybe it'll be worth finding out if that is that the consumer, right? it might be that it's three kilos, in which case we have a lot more room to play, play with. It might mm -hmm. be that anyone who straps two kilos to their feet is like, this sucks. I don't care how fast it goes. <laughs> I'm not gonna... <laughs> and so I was kind of like, why don't we make a mock-up of the shoe, have people come in to test it tell them we're having technical issues, the motors aren't working right now, but could you just try them on, walk around, walk up some stairs, and we can literally just cut it out of wood and glue on some motors. It'll take us a week to make a pair of these things instead of like six months of like, you know, finite <laughs> element analysis and like, can we do this in carbon fiber? Okay, can we read, whatever. Like, right. and it's just so easy as the person with the idea where you have this goal in mind, um, to kind of be like, no, 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 it needs to be this. And, and, right. and you just end up spending a, a lot of uh, money and time pursuing that. Now, that's easier said than <laughs> um, Yeah, to be um, I bought this machine without knowing what I would do with it. Uh, buckles were just one of the ideas. And so I definitely did not follow my own advice. Um, <laughs> and so, you know. But, um, <laughs> I just wanted these for my bike. So I figured worst case scenario, I'd just make some for me, make some for friends. And then um, I had a lot of other work that would use this machine anyway, like other right. clients needed stuff. So, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, so we've got one, one question here that someone asked. Um, <clears throat> are there any considerations with the webbing straps used? How do they fare with the repeated compression from the buckles jaws in the long term? Uh, we've talked about the buckle side of things. Did you have yeah. to source a particularly like robust strap to 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 um, you know butt up against the teeth? Uh, so it's it's uh it's nylon. Nylon's pretty good with abrasion. Uh, you know, I suspect over will definitely need replacing. Um, I think one goal that I set out with was. Uh, that people would cut these buckles out of soft goods that they're throwing away um, because hopefully they are precious enough and right. sewing a new strap onto one of these <laughs> things is super trivial. Um, if anyone needs that done, you know, reach out. We can definitely make that happen. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know that there's a, a way around that. I think things wear and uh, yeah, at some point I think it will just get fuzzy and you might want to change it. Um, one failure definitely I've definitely seen is, you know, when you load it to failure, definitely, or close to failure, you'll, it'll start to pull on the webbing in kind of a destructive way, but that's m many hundreds of pounds. So yeah, as long as the webbing goes first, <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so we've got a question yeah. here from Forger. Uh, are you, are you considering moving out of the barn? Uh, <laughs> if uh, if when the second machine comes in <laughs> so um, we, we can only see like a, a portion of the machine like how how large is the machine itself um the machine let's see the machine is about like nine feet by nine feet by okay. uh seven eight feet tall so it's like a small shed <laughs> people when they see the machine and then they see these coming off of it they <laughs> crack up uh yeah it's a little absurd um the plan currently is to build a loft over this space. So we have about 300-ish square feet, uh, so pretty tight. Um, and so putting a loft in will we'll bump that up by like 60%. And so right now it's all one floor. We have our CNC. Uh, 
uh, it goes to tumbling, then to our thing, uh, paint, assembly, sewing, shipping. Um, and so we'd probably move, um, you know, paint and assembly and possibly the shipping station upstairs. And then that would free up space for one more machine. The goal is to stay in the barn for another year or so. It's expensive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What does the machine weigh? Uh, this machine weighs, I think, 9,800 pounds. So wow. almost 10,000 pounds. Um, the other machine we were looking at was 15,000 pounds. Oh, dang. <laughs> so this, is, this is light enough that you can set it on like a four inch slab, which is typical for residential um, without it being an issue. Uh, yeah. Once you get into like 15,000 pounds, it's a. Yeah. I need more concrete. <laughs> so when you when you got it how was <clears throat> i mean I, i'm assuming it came in parts and it was assembled or was it just like one big truck backed in and here you go sorry you, you broke up for, could you repeat the question uh, when you when the machine uh, got to the barn was it brought in parts and assembled in the barn or did it just show up in the truck <laughs> um, so the way you get these machines typically unless you uh want to do your own rigging uh, is you have the machine delivered to a rigging company and then they deliver it and they have insurance. And if they drop your machine, uh, <laughs> they replace it. You know, obviously there's a delay there, but, uh, and they do it a lot. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so we just uh, paid someone to, we told them exactly where we wanted it and then they just bring it in on a truck and they have a forklift that can, you know, take 15,000 pounds um, and, you know, uh, they didn't end up having to do it, but they brought some steel plates because I showed, like I sent them photos. So approaching the barn is over some like gravel. And if it's wet, it gets a little soft. Mm -hmm. uh, drive the weight of the plus plus the machine without sinking in. You know, so that that's their, that's their job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. We're hitting, or we pass that hour mark. Um, so thanks again for, for being on the live stream. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Um, it's been fun. Yeah. So again, guys, if you want to check out the buckles um, that they're making over at uh, Austere, let me get it in focus here. Super colorful, super strong, made in the U.S. Uh, lots of intricate details like we discussed, you know, the spring and the teeth and everything. Uh, who knew? Who knew so much could, could go into such a, a simple uh, product? Um, so... If you guys like this content, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, speaking of, of things being made, we had these stickers made. Um, help support the channel. All the links in the description below. And as always, everybody, keep the supple side down.